Welcome to CEO Corner. My name is Sarah McGrath, Director in 360 Search Recruitment Services across Ireland and the UK, and I work with CEOs and senior executives, helping them find their next career move and building their teams. I would like to welcome Ruth Bailey, CEO of Vigo Health, a startup focusing on new initiatives in health and well-being for those under 35. Ruth and her co-founder created the concept, created a business plan, negotiated investment, built their MVP, launched their platform, hired their teams, and launched their brand to the market in the middle of a pandemic, doing all of this 100% remotely. Ruth is no stranger to a health insurance startup. She was co-founder of Glow Health in 2012, which was sold to Irish Life in 2016. Ruth holds a master's in strategic management, a degree in marketing. She holds an executive diploma in finance, an executive diploma in strategic marketing, is QFA qualified and CIP qualified. And we are thrilled that Ruth is joining us on CEO Corner today to share her journey. Welcome to CEO Corner, Ruth. Thank you, thank you for having me. So I'd like to start with a question, a get to know you question, and I'd love to learn about your background and what it was like for you growing up. Sure. So um, I grew up in Ballantyre in Dundrum and um, I uh, was raised by my father. My mum died when I was six, so my dad raised myself, my brother and my sister, um, which probably developed uh, a personality that was already independent to start with. Um, and uh, that kind of set me on a course to, to kind of, I suppose, do my own thing a little bit. Um, went to school, didn't really know what I wanted to do in college and in my career and um, put down marketing. Didn't know what it was, really, <laughs> but said, oh, sure, look, it's better than repeating my leaving cert. Put it down and um, got, a, got a place in marketing college and started marketing and just, I was like, right, now, now this is it. Loved it. Started doing really, really well in college just because I loved mm -hmm. the, the, the stuff and the content and the materials. So that kind of set me on my course to kind of going into marketing as a career and, and kind of who I was and such. Yeah. Yeah, so you started out your life as a marketeer. Yes, definitely. <laughs> so for all yeah. the marketing people out there, this is this could be your path. Yeah, for sure. And and I started as a marketeer, but as I said, not consciously mm. so. Not yeah. like, you know, I had this burning desire. I mean, marketing when I was in college isn't what marketing is today. You know, internet was barely invented as well. Not quite, but you know, <laughs> there was no, you know, social media. There was none of that. So, mm. so it was kind of, a, it was a different type of marketing. But I, you know, I, I, I suppose through marketing, got exposed to business and yeah. business in Great. general and, and through that path just got exposed to it all yeah know. great when you were approached about co-founding and, and starting the business that initially you had you know a sense of doubt or an insecurity or your thought was i'm not ready for this you know how has that or what did you do to change that feeling yeah and it's um it's 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 I think utterly normal is, is the first thing. And you're absolutely right. Um, my co-founder, Stephen and I, we had been working on the business idea for a while and the topic came up of who was going to be the CEO. And I just assumed it would be Stephen and um, I'd be COO and we'd work together very closely, but that, that he would be the CEO. Um, and why did I assume that? Probably because he's more experienced than me. And he said, no, 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 absolutely not. You have to do it. And I was like, no, you have to do it. And and we had this conversation around whose skill set was was kind of, I suppose, more lended itself more more to, to a CEO. So what we agreed was that I would think about it. And um, I went and I spoke to my mentor and I have a fabulous mentor who's a, a former CEO himself. And the first thing he said to me is this is normal. Every CEO or about to be CEO, you know, experiences fear or experiences that imposter syndrome, like I'm not going to be able to do this. And, you know, in some ways, if you didn't, you'd nearly be worried. Um, and yeah. that fear, that fear drives you on to, I think, try harder to do your best because, you know, face your fears and do it anyway and, and take the risk of, of trying it. So I think once once I got that perspective from, from my mentor and the role that he played in my decision making, it, I kind of I, I came to terms with the fact that, OK, this this mindset is normal. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give it a go. And ultimately, I kind of concluded that I would only ever regret not doing it. Mm. I would never regret doing it, yeah. you know, and and you know, you, you have to kind of go with your gut from, from that perspective. Yeah, and the importance of having a mentor. 
you know, it's just crucial, I think, when you're trying to develop. Without a doubt, and I've been so lucky, I've had mentors all the way through, different mentors all the way through my career, and not in a kind of a formalised mentoring programme way, more of a kind of an informal kind of way where either I found people or, or they found me and we've had kind of chats. and. That, I, I know that there has been roles uh, that I've had over my career that I would not have gone for or I would not have felt confident enough in had I not been kind of encouraged and supported by my mentor. So, I mean, my view is everybody should have a mentor um, and, and find one. If you don't have one, find one. And, you know, you're, you're never too junior or too senior um, to, to have one because a perspective, a different perspective is always going to be so valuable. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I've had them myself and, yeah. you know, continue to have them now. You've seen many different working environments. You've been in a startup before, before now. You've worked in small companies. You've also worked in, in multinationals. So what was it that brought you back to a startup? And, and what have you done differently this time around from your experience in, in setting up GLOW? Sure. So yeah, I've, I've, this is my third startup um, and uh, kind of two previous kind of large multinational um, financial services companies. And, why, why am I attracted to startups? Gosh, um, you know, startups get such bad press. Um, and and I, 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 the, the, there's this view that startups are really aggressive environments and that they're really, really long hours and that, you know, staff aren't, you know, rewarded or appreciated. And all I can say is that has not been my experience at all. And, you know, what, what appeals to me about a startup is that there is, yes, there is a high degree of kind of uncertainty. There's a high degree of unknowns, but you get to answer those questions and you get to figure it out. And, you know, from a, I suppose from a pace perspective, they tend to go a little faster, I think, than, than a more kind of structured organisation. But, you know, you're in charge of trying to say, if you don't know something, right, let's go figure it out. And I, I find that personally really motivating. And a lot of people who are, um, you know, attracted to startups are, are, are find that really motivating. And certainly the, the team in Vigo Health, um, they, they're an amazing team and they are all, you know, I suppose, unbeknownst to themselves, ideal for startups, you know, with two nurses. Uh, just to give you a little example, um, one of our nurses, Robin, she, she expressed a desire and interest in social media. So we were able to create a role for her and say, right, off you go, do the social media, do some content for us, um, you know, learn, experiment, learn. And if you fail, it's okay, but you'll have learned along the way. Um, Sarah, one of our other nurses, um, she's much more kind of interested in technology and platforms, so she gets involved in our tech development. And that, that's just two examples that wouldn't probably happen in a large organisation. So providing that kind of, I suppose, space or that environment for people to experiment and to learn is really, really impactful and really, really motivating for, for people who, who, who are attracted to startups, you know. I think there's such satisfaction as well from, you know, it's down to you, to Absolutely. what you achieve, you know, and the team and people around you. And, and yeah. I find that even in a small company, you know, when, when we've been a startup, it's it's just so satisfying and terrifying. Yeah, <laughs> All at the same for time. sure, for yeah, sure. And yeah, the, the, I mean, the thing about it is, is like, Nobody knows all the answers. We, we, nobody knows. If, if somebody came in and said they had all the answers, I'd say, right, well, you can't be telling the truth. Yeah. Nobody <laughs> does. So it's about us all together trying to figure it out. And, and that's really, really exciting, you know. I read a report, Deloitte's um, Global Women's Boardroom Report, and it actually explains how underrepresented women are in a boardroom setting. And they, they, the report looks at this from a global perspective. And they're saying that 16.9% of women globally hold board seats. Uh, like, I, I just thought that was outstanding, sure. you know, or sorry, astounding. Yeah. Um, what are you seeing, you know, in your experience and, and being a board member and, um, you know, women being represented? Yeah, look, it's a really, really um, important topic. It's a really, it's a topic that I feel very, very strongly about, uh, as you might imagine. I mean, in, in Vigo Health, we've got 40% represent women representation on the board, so it's not bad, not quite uh, gender equality yet, but uh, we're, we're, we're very close to it. Look, I think, um, in general, there's loads of research that says that, you know, more balanced boards perform better. So won't kind of go into that again. I think it's, it's, it's almost accepted that a more gender balanced board is better for the company and um, better for the stakeholders, better for employees, better for shareholders. I mean, I think the, the, the pipeline is, is one thing that, you know, gets talked about a lot. And back to what, what we've just spoken about, the role of mentors and how women can be supported to, I suppose, feel that they're ready for board positions or to, to apply for board positions. Um, 
because I think without that support and without that mentorship, you know, we, we are going to see, you know, glacial change before we get to, to gender parity. And, you know, ultimately, men are decision making at the moment. They may not realise it, but it's, it's, you know, more often than not, it's, it's, it's right now, it's men who are, who are more likely to be appointing board members. So it's, it's, it's men and, uh, who are, have to, I suppose, make the change in many ways. Women have to be available and put themselves forward. But it's, it's men showing leadership on it as well. Who'll, who'll make the change? And I think if if women are you know, embracing the opportunity to go for more senior appointments or go for a promotion, you know, naturally they'll move up the career ladder, which then I think will open opportunities to join boards and become more involved at a senior level. You know, I, I, I work with so many amazing women that are looking to change their careers, and you know, some women are so driven and so hungry, and some women are are just so happy to you know, work a nine to five and they just don't want the stress. So I, I would love to see more women just, yeah. you know, really want it. Absolutely. You know? And like, that's, that's absolutely yeah. fine too. And, and, and what I would also say is whatever, you know, whatever is your own motivation is, yeah. is, is what it should be. But, you know, I think I, I've certainly come across plenty of women who are more than capable and aren't either putting themselves forward or getting those board opportunities, but would be excellent on boards. Um, and, and, you know, I think until that, Kind of starts to balance itself out where women who you know are capable and who do want it are better represented well we have to you know keep fighting the good fight you know, you know, that's what we're doing now. We're fighting it. <laughs> exactly you've achieved a lot you know at, at a young age you have been part of two startups you've held senior appointments in multinationals and more impressively you've had three maternity leaves yeah. and a year's career break so yeah. you know i i just that fascinates me and and i would love to know you know what sort of mindset does it take to come back from maternity leave, embrace your career and I guess somewhat keep reinventing yourself? Yeah, and it's it's funny when you say it like that, it look it sounds like um that there's been lots of different change. And I guess there has been to an extent, but you know, the the general rule I or the general guide I use is always follow my gut, always follow my instinct. And um, you know, on paper a, a decision mightn't make sense. But if internally it feels like the right thing to do, then then you should do it. You know, um, some of the things you've mentioned there. Like, so, for example, the career break. I took I took a, a year's career break um, after Irish Life had had bought Vigo Health or Glow Health rather, um, and uh, you know I was in a really good place. I was on the senior management team, and some people said to me, "Are you mad? You're doing really well. This is going to you know hurt your career." And I just kind of felt, no, you know what? Um, it's the right time for me to take take a step back. I took a year out to to just hang out at home and hang out with my kids it was a great year and it was it was a year where I think I developed my mindset and so what I would say is it's never wasted time it's never wasted opportunity a career and career progression shouldn't be a linear thing it shouldn't be you have to go to the next rung and the next rung you know side steps to different roles you know uh, moving backwards taking time out taking a pause they all teach you something you know, and they all develop you as a person or as a professional that I think certainly from my experience, um, you know, kind of changing around quite a lot that, that that has, you know, happened for me. And definitely I can I can say that had I not have taken that year's career break, would I have had the energy and the drive to take on another startup and to take the role of CEO? Possibly not. So, you know, it was the right thing for me at the time, you know, so just go with your gut would be, would be what I'd say. And, and I guess staying on the topic of maternity leave so I'm pregnant and massive congratulations thank you uh, due my first baby in February lovely so that does not come without its own insecurities and anxiety and you know around taking a break from my career yeah. um, you know spent many years building it so, and I think the, the the thoughts and the insecurities whether they're real or not you know they're, they're there um, yes, and it's around what will my job be when I come back? You know, is there still a place for me in the business? Am I going to perform at the same level? I know I'm not alone in, in kind of what I'm feeling. You know, and, and having experienced this yourself, you know, and coming back to the workforce after having three babies, yeah. you know, how have you managed this negative thought or, or mm. this doubt please tell me because yeah. i need to know <laughs> uh, like gosh I, I don't know if i have the answers uh, all i can tell you is is is, is kind of how i work through it and you're absolutely right i mean particularly your first maternity leave i remember my first maternity leave i was i was working at the times the head of marketing in aviva health and um you know i was doing well career-wise and i was you know really really passionate about what we were doing and i was you know really loved my job um, and you know, I, I did have all these thoughts. I was like, "Gosh, what, what's going to happen?" And 
is there somebody who's going to be better than me, who's going to take over when I'm gone, when I come back, and am I going to come back to a, a lesser job? And as it turned out, I need not have worried at all because while I was on maternity leave, I actually got a, a call to, to join the founding team in, in Glow Health. So, so it, I went on a different path. But I think the point is, you know, when you look at it, in the moment, of course, it's really, really, you know, scary. But if you look at it kind of at, in the round, you know, most women might have two to three maternity leaves over the course of a career. You're talking about 18 months to two years. Yeah. Out of the course of a 40 year career, it's nothing. Sure. It's not about the time. It's about your mindset. And you know, if you're if if you're, you know, first of all, want to come back. You want to, and some people don't, and that's that's okay too. But if you want to come back and you know continue um, at the pace you're at, you know, the opportunities will be there. There'll always be time for opportunities. What I would say for both men and women is that what you can't get back is time back with your little ones. You know, and it goes so fast. And and you know, for for both parents, you know, spending time. With, with your small family is, you know, it, it just can't be beaten. And of course you have to give 100% when you're at work, you absolutely do. But, you know, I, I also feel you have to give 100% when, when you're at home and just be really mindful in the moment. And, you know, I remember reading um, an, an interview with Gay Byrne um, when he was quite sick before he died, saying one of his life's regrets was that he worked too much and he didn't spend enough time with his family. And I just thought if somebody like Gay Byrne can say this, you know, when he's quite sick, I would hate to be the person on my way out saying the same thing. Yeah. And look, there's, you know, of course, some days you get it wrong, and some days, you know, you you, you work too much or not enough with your family, or sometimes you're with your family and, and you can't make it work. But I I think today that is, you know, that's something for both men and women to look at together. Yeah. Um, and certainly in, in in our household, anyway, we have a 50-50 a share of, yeah. of responsibilities, which is which is amazing. You know? Yeah, it'd definitely be the same in my household. Yeah, good, 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 <laughs> good. yeah it would be 50-50, <laughs> yeah. And I guess I'm so lucky as well with the, the people that I'm in business with, you know, they're nothing but supportive. Yeah. And I think I'm my worst enemy nearly, you know, and, yeah, and, and I'm yeah. sure most women that are career driven go through this, you know, and, and women that I've spoken to, I've, I've had these conversations. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I, I definitely take comfort in what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, the jobs and opportunities and careers will always be there. They'll always be there because if you're good at your job, you'll be good at your job regardless. Yeah, They'll always true. be there. Taking, you know, six months or whatever amount of time off is not going to, is not going to change that. You're probably going to have to change how you work and that's, you know, totally normal and actually probably not a bad thing anyway. Um, but, you know, opportunities for, for career and for, for ambitious women are still there with the family, you know. Uh, Vigo is four months old, yes. so it's still a baby. It's very much in startup mode. What ambitions do you have for the culture and kind of the, the, the goals of the business? Yeah, so we set up, as, as I said, we set up, we launched Vigo Health in, in May of this year. Um, and we launched, I suppose, we, we identified, Stephen, my co-founder and I, we, we identified an opportunity in the market um, for people who don't have health insurance, but still want a level of kind of, I suppose, a health and wellbeing solution that meets their needs. And the, there really wasn't anything. Um, and, and when you, I suppose, look at that and we started drilling down into it and we kind of looked at the figures and the numbers and we, said, we saw that, you know, younger adults, typically, you know, under 35s, the likelihood of them having health insurance is so much lower and lower every day. Um, and, and so we knew that there was a kind of, I suppose, an opportunity. We knew there was there was a kind of a gap in the market, and through research, we did lots and lots of research, we realised actually this is what, what what people want. But we felt, look, we have to do something, you know, really, really impactful and really, really, um, I suppose, compelling for people to, to to want this. And digital health and virtual healthcare is a big part of our offering. Um, and you know, you might say that we developed a kind of, I suppose, a virtual health kind of offering or a digital health offering in the middle of a, a pandemic, um, which which was at the same time, you know, shifting a huge amount of behavioural change for how people consume healthcare anyway. So, you know, the timing was, was really right, but we, you know, we had to bring, and we are bringing, you know, a lot of innovation to the market. We had to develop it, our own in-house digital health uh, advisory service. Um, how you do that, and, and, and what, what's important for me is the team, and, and how we, we, are, we will be successful will be the team. And the team we've got in Vigo Health are, are super. They're way better than I am, uh, thank God. Um, and, and, you know, I mentioned a few minutes ago, giving them the space um, and the kind of safety to experiment. Um, startups, and, and startups are one thing, but a startup 
creating a new category that doesn't exist is, is a whole other ball game. And, you know, there's so many unknowns. There were so many assumptions that we made that, that we're wrong about and will be wrong about that we don't even know yet. But, you know, having, I suppose, the, the you know, that the team feel that they can, you know, test things and try things and not, not have a fear of failure. So in terms of culture, you know, it's, it's, this is actually really important to me because I feel startups do get such bad press for, for, for this kind of aggressive culture. And it's really, really important to me that Vigo Health has a culture of, you know, we'll try and we'll figure it out and we'll, you know, we'll answer the unknowns, but we'll do it in a safe environment so that you can test and trial, you know, as you go. Yeah, creating really the entrepreneurial spirit yeah. among the team. For sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I've had a couple of conversations of late about third level education and further education and does it play a role in advancing careers anymore? I think, you know, we're living in a time where it may not even come up in a conversation. You know, it's becoming less relevant at interview stage and you, know, you can be whatever you want to be. Everyone can be an entrepreneur in today's world. You know, what is your thought or how do you feel about, you know, third level education mm -hmm. for advancing careers? Well, look, I think to, to start with, um, I, I, I understand the perspective around, you know, that that there's so much you can learn on the internet these days and, and do you really need to go to college? And, you know, I, I referenced a few minutes ago, you know, my course, I did undergrad marketing 20-ish years ago now, that course today would be vastly different, you know, so <laughs> redundant, different, yeah, totally <laughs> redundant. So, you know, what value did that have? However, however, um, first of all, you know, we will never stop learning and I think the world is changing at such pace at the moment and will only continue to change at a faster pace and keeping up with 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 how you know business and how different things are changing you know through education to me is really really important and you know to give you an example I've done you know I did my, my undergrad and I did a master's but I've continued to do a lot of courses along the way and um, my most recent course is I did a, a course in corporate finance um, during the first lockdown there is no way, no matter how much I read on the internet, I would have gotten the same level of understanding that I got in the lectures and the remote lectures from my other students my, and, and from the lecturer. Um, you know, there's just no way uh, that I would have got that. And I also think the discipline of researching a topic, you know, um, and, and of really kind of going through your paces that you get in third level um, is a skill that's worth having. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, a bit odd, but I love an L exam. <laughs> there's nothing like an exam to really, just to compete against yourself. Self, uh, just to see how far it's you. The satisfaction. The satisfaction of, doing it, yeah. of doing it and doing well, you know. Yeah, and, yeah, and of course. I do. I do love an L exam. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I'm the same. I'm, I'm years in third level. Like for me, it's more. It's really like personal development. You know, for that's sure. what I enjoy yeah. about it. Um, I understand, Ruth, that you have have never had to go through the rigorous interview process, and you know, your appointments have been direct approaches and headhunts, and you know, you've obviously stood out, and people wanted you to work for them. I find, you know, and sometimes recruitment process can be daunting, long, difficult, and can result in disappointment. You know, what advice do you have for somebody to build their network and, you know, become a standout employee and develop their skills so that they do get headhunted or, you know, they are themselves nearly a brand and somebody approaches them because like what you've experienced, they, they want you to work for them. Sure, yeah, and um, you know, I, again, I've been a little bit probably lucky and a little bit I've come across the right people at the right time and a little bit of, you know, I've, I've kind of put myself out there, you know, and you know, the idea of your own personal brand is, is really, I think it's really interesting and it's really important. And unbeknownst to myself, when you know, I started out working, um, you know, I was developing my personal brand. I didn't know I was doing it at the time, okay. you know, um, and it wasn't like, oh, I'll get a reputation for doing this. It was, you know, work hard like it's 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 the basics it's it's work hard and it's also you know what what I've personally found is you know I've never been afraid to raise my hand and ask a question and sometimes that question is I don't understand this can you tell me um, so having the confidence to speak up and to speak out um, and as I said it's not always about making a contribution sometimes it's like please help me um, and and I think that has you know helped and that did help me along the way in terms of kind of developing a, a reputation for somebody who work hard mm -hmm. but if they don't know the answer they'll try and you know get the answer or they'll ask for help or they'll try and figure it out and you know, I think putting yourself forward for things is also, you know, really, really um, important. 
um, you know, I have put myself forward mo almost all the time because I was genuinely interested in them. So please can I be on that project? I'd really like to work on such and such or, you know, go to, to, to people outside of your particular department and ask for uh, input. And I think that along the way um, ha has definitely stood to me um, because, you know, I've, 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 I suppose, made myself known um, because of it. And, you know, I think simple things like networking which is kind of hard at the moment because you know events are, are, are kind of curtailed but you know the use of LinkedIn um, and also you know what I used to do quite a lot in my earlier career and again not for career development because I was genuinely interested um, I used to rock up to the actuaries and I used to explain that to me and 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 they would yeah. they would you know they were great they were always really really patient and and they would and it was great and you do then get a, a kind of I suppose a reputation yeah. for somebody who who kind of you know sees things in the round you know yeah. um uh, so so that's that's I mean I don't know how I did it really uh, that's the best kind of answer I can give you but but definitely you know speak up yeah. and ask put the hand up definitely you know be inquisitive and be a little bit nosy <laughs> totally. It's not like you have to speak up at a meeting to give a contribution. Speaking up at a meeting sometimes is like, but why? Be like a three-year-old, but why? You know, yeah. and, and, and I think that, that helps a lot. Yeah. Great. That's, that's good advice. <laughs> so I think with overachievers, and you know, you're, you're clearly a, an overachiever, um, I think there can sometimes be a battle you know, with sometimes mental health and, and feeling doubt. And I think we've seen it actually in the Olympics um, yeah. uh, more recently. And you know some of the traits and characteristics that come with an overachiever can be experiencing doubt, questioning yourself, like what you did actually when you were approached for for Vigo, and you know having a standard. And if you are not within 100% of that standard, then it's an automatic failure. Mm -hmm. And I think you know sometimes that can have a positive effect and, and also a negative effect. And how have you managed these emotions and, and kind of continue to push on and not let them take over? Yeah, and look. There's no kind of, I suppose, right or wrong answer to this. I, I mean, from my own personal experience, um, you know, first of all, uh, Stephen, my co-founder, um, we work together really, really closely. So if there's, you know, any kind of significant business issue or challenge or anything that I need to, you know, really think about, we, we work it through together. So, so uh, you know, to that extent, I don't feel like I'm, I'm on my own, you know. Um, but what, what my mentor did say to me before uh, I took this role and, uh, as a former CEO, you know, a CEO's role can be very lonely and it, it, it can be a lonely place at times. And what I mean by that is, you know, people are looking to you for all the answers. Sometimes you don't have those answers. Um, and particularly in a startup environment where, you know, uncertainty is high. And, you know, for, for me, how I deal with it is just, you know, is honesty and say, look, I, I don't know, but let's try and figure this out together, you know. Um, and as opposed to trying to create um, this kind of image that I've got all the answers and don't worry, I know exactly what's happening and where we're going because of course I don't, you know, I've, you know, I've got a good plan by the way, <laughs> but, but, but it's, you know, of course you don't know all the answers. So, so I think, you know, just being honest and being true about, you know, what is, what is realistic is, is really important. Um, two other things, uh, I've, I've mentioned it so many times, I cannot say enough the, about the importance of a mentor, the role a mentor will play and my mentor is, is, is excellent and some days, you know, I'll, I'll speak to him and, um, you know, if I'm overanalyzing something or if I'm overthinking something, he'll go, just don't sweat it. I'll go, okay, grand. You know, it's really good. <laughs> and and I have to say, you know, finally, just to, to to mention, you know, the support I get at home. My husband Damien is, is, is exceptionally supportive of what I do. And there are days, of course there are, like everybody has them where you have a you know a hard day at the office or a hard day at work. And you know, I'm kind of huffing and puffing a bit. And he listens and he goes, Okay, grand, that's enough now. You know, and, and but it was really good because I need that as well. So, you know, I think a combination of support you have in an outside world a mentorship role and, and trying to be as honest as you can is how I've dealt with it you know it's it's, it's certainly not the the recipe that might suit everybody but it's certainly how I do it I know my my business partner Linda we're probably working together nearly 10 years and I, I honestly we lean on each other so much and I yeah. think having somebody to support you and for you to support them in business as you say it's lonely at the top you know and, sure. and and you can make enemies along the way as well um, but I, I, you know, I definitely, I definitely agree that that support network is is crucial to help you build your career. Yeah. So we have three fun questions to wrap up the interview. Okay. So first one is, what was the last book that you read? 
oh, I read, I'm an avid reader, I love reading. I'm in two book clubs and I've just finished Amazing. last night. <laughs> yeah, oh God, I love reading. I just finished last night a book who I, I'd highly recommend. I'm going into book club mode now. Um, <laughs> uh, Boys Don't Cry by Fiona okay. Scarlett. Oh, it is just, it, she's an Irish writer and um, it's so sad and compelling and uh, just just fabulous read. Yeah. So, um, so that was my most recent yeah. book, loved it. Great, okay. And who do you admire most in the world and why? Oh, sure, look, there's loads of people you could choose. I mean, I think at the moment, um, the, the standout person for me is Jacinda Ardern. I think she is amazing. Mm. She's strong, a strong female character, obviously, but has a huge amount of empathy as well, you know, and she, she's delivering fantastic results, but, you know, total leadership, showing total leadership, you know, and there's so many people you could name, but she's the one that, that, that really kind of springs to mind. I think. Yeah, she's definitely one that I would, I would agree with. Yeah. Um, and if you were stuck on a desert island, what three items would you bring? Oh Why? gosh, right, okay. I'll assume there's no broadband, so I'll leave my phone at home. <laughs> um, what would I bring? Um, books, a book, I don't know which one, but a Your book. book club. A book club. <laughs> if I could bring my book and club with me, that'd be great. A uh, book, um, I think I would bring my runners, which is kind of a bit boring because like going for nice walks and like, you know, I'm not a runner, but I do small jogs. And that for mental health yeah. is just, just to get you through. If you're on a desert island, it might be boring. So you'd need the runners <laughs> to get you through. Um, and the third one, uh, photo of my kids, photo of my family. Nice. Brilliant. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Sorted. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Thank really enjoyed you. it. Thank you. Thanks.